Hello everybody. Uh, we will now have a keynote address on the future of technology, resilience and partnerships, where our guest speaker is the Honorable Minister of State for External Affairs and Culture, Ms. Minakshi Lakey. Ma'am, as a member of parliament from New Delhi, before she took over as minister, as a parliamentarian, she had served on many parliamentary committees, including as chair of the Joint Parliamentary Committee on the Data Protection Bill. She also has had a distinguished career in the practice, in the practice of law. Ma'am, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, we would also like to thank the minister in advance for agreeing to be in conversation with the director, Mr. Rudra Chaudhary, as well. Thank you, ma'am. Please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone, and uh, what an honor and pleasure to be here amongst um, all tech experts who are connected both virtually and uh, uh, physically with the program. It only shows, I was, uh, while being briefed, I was told that people from 107 countries are connected to this particular GTI summit, which means the world is looking at India for the answers as well as leadership. And we are able to offer the leadership and also the answers because of our prowess. And I tell everyone, I said one thing which we have in plenty, uh, which people may not give us credit for, is the brains. So we have plenty of brains spread all over. Uh, we belong to a very, very intelligent community. Uh, we have done not so well for many reasons in the past, and we are able to sustain ourselves and have shown resilience uh, because uh, technically we have been a wounded civilization, and once civilizational aspects get to be addressed, which could be socioeconomic or political, we get to take the leap forward. And how our leadership came across is uh, for everyone to see that India's performance during COVID, which was a challenge not just to us, but globally to everyone, and how world sustained and showed resilience also exists, how countries are facing the problem even up till now is for everyone to see, and how technology can be used and misused also is a lesson in science and technology for everyone. And when we are talking about COVID-19, the, the lessons we have learned from this has also been the use of technology. Much maligned world, but use of technology, which came handy in finding many, many solutions. So if I talk about the former health minister, Mr. Dr. Harsh Vardhan, he got to be part of the executive board of WHO in 2020. And um, this is at the universal level that India became part of WHO. India became part of the solution and not part of the problem. We became part of CEPI, which was basically to deal with uh, preparedness and epidemic management. And um, 130 crore people whose vaccination program had to be made by our country uh, efficiently keeping the live virus alive and managing the chains, the logistic chains, the cold chains, managing the technicians who had to infuse the virus in a certain time period, uh, producing, the vi the, producing the vaccine, uh, a country which of course had a pharma capital many ways and had the capacity, but could not innovate and go get ahead because of paucity of funds. Where the government of India came handy and provided the funds to private players and also made it possible that we come up with a captive pr production, captive uh, manufacturing capacity and building that within the country. And the result are two top class vaccines which have been built. Irrespective of the vaccine politics across the globe, which pharma companies may indulge in, 
we've managed to vaccinate our people very well. And the vaccination process itself shows that how good we could be if we really put our heart and soul into a project and how we can put even technology to use like Covin platform. Covin platform was a solution and part of solving the problem of vaccinating so many people and also certification that they have been vaccinated, also monitoring as to when the next dose is going to be, which are the target regions, connecting it with the districts, connecting it with Aadhaar card, and also making it indirectly mandatory without, force, without the use of force, but mandatory because it's in everybody's interest to get vaccinated. People were still debating in many countries whether to wear a mask or not to wear a mask, whether to get a vaccination dose or not to get a vaccination dose. Uh, we are famous for so-called illiteracy and rural, uh, ca rural connectivity issues. Uh, but irrespective of all those challenges, we've managed to reach out to everyone. And those who have been left out, Ghar Ghar Dastak is the program that every home needs to be, we need to knock at every door to get more and more people on board with the vaccination process. And I must compliment all those who have been associated with this particular program and project to showcase that this is what India stands for inexpensive, top-of-the-line quality, very good technology, and technical know-how. And end of the day, we are scientific people with scientific temperament. And when we are discussing technology today, I think these are our mission words which the world has to listen to and where the global leadership need to come forward. So whether it is um, Aryabhat Research Institute, ARIES, or it is the India Dutch, the Dutch Indian uh, water leadership, we are there and we are providing the leadership to ourselves and to the world. And we are important key stakeholders in whatever the world has to be part of. And when India becomes a key holder or key stakeholder in global technologies and global well-beings, uh, I must put it on record that Mission Innovation is one project where, which was started in 2015 and India sowed the seeds for that Mission Innovation, in which we got about uh, uh, nine R&D projects and for smart grids in which the participation, I have the numbers with me and I must share the numbers. In this, uh, we have the numbers like uh, uh, some very, very amazing numbers. So 20 countries got involved uh, with uh, uh, nine R&D project, 17 Indian institutes, 22 foreign institutes, and uh, 15 Indian institutes and eight industry people, uh, eight innovators. So can you imagine this kind of number just to put them together on one smart grid project? And uh, this is the kind of work we are capable of uh, building. And when it comes to uh, participation, and because today's program is all about global partnerships, whether it's GPAI, so Global Partnership for Artificial Intelligence, uh, we are very much uh, part of the same. And when it comes to internet users, I think India showcases a number which many can't rival. And that is 290 million in 2019 is the Indian rural internet user base. And uh, that kind of base is something which, uh, uh, which is uh, for any tech company or any tech uh, service provider a number to compete for. And uh, I was looking at other uh, data and it came to uh, 1, 1,38,000 uh, gram panchayats which have been connected through BharatNet and we have a program to connect all the gram panchayats uh, which is 2,50,000 gram panchayats through BharatNet, which means we are wanting to connect as many people 
and as many people living in uh, villages to be connected through uh, smart uh, grid and smart net. And 50 million minutes is what Indians use per day on WhatsApp video calling. This is how communication technology is important for Indians. And why I'm sharing this data is uh, for the reason that this data itself shows uh, that we are a very, very large market for technology. For any innovation, uh, the seeds of technology have to be counted in numbers. And these are some amazing numbers. Also shows that how the so-called um, uh, rural bound uh, um, uh, Indian is tech savvy and uses technology for communication as well as information and sharing of knowledge. And during a uh, pandemic, so many children coming from say not so well of backgrounds were also using internet facilities to get themselves educated and have gotten themselves trained through education mechanism and also trained their parents and got them hooked on to the same. And uh, when it comes to the platform and products and services, 84% of the country is 4G enabled. So which itself is uh, the kind of, uh, I must say, investment one is looking at. So if we are thinking of moving to 5G, 6G, 7G, this is the kind of uh, investment which is needed. So when it comes to platform and services, we must look at this large picture. And when we are looking at this larger picture, we are also looking at uh, some short-term goals, and we need some uh, long-term goals. And between short-term and long-term goals, we need an act of balancing. And this act of balancing uh, will have all kinds of implications, from privacy uh, to, to um, illegal hacking, to cyber security, uh, to data mining. Uh, both ethical and unethical means need to be balanced. And also, the innovation and technology requires that kind of funding and finance mechanism. And uh, thus, a fairness of the deal is always very, very relevant and important uh, for any country like a developing country like ours. And uh, in this case, 78% or income is uh, what 78% uh, uh, maintain or are seeking increase in the investment. 78% of the industry is today, because as per one um, survey, uh, it was found that 78% of the industry is looking at that either they are maintaining whatever investments they have been making, or they are looking at increasing that investment. So it becomes a relevant data for the industrial output program as well to look at the kind of goals we are looking at. And when it comes to, say, today's uh, entire, uh, the topic is about uh, the, the global meets local and also uh, the kind of cooperation we are looking at. So I must uh, mention that when it comes to various partnerships in technology, in technology, we, we are partnering with uh, similarly placed countries. Similarly, because uh, either they are similar because of the value system, they are democratic countries. These are countries which have uh, a good base in technology, and uh, they may be uh, uh, looking at uh, markets, or they may be wanting to put in their money in terms of FDI and uh, they're looking for right places to do that. So France, India, Japan, uh, the, the three countries will, are looking at uh, partnership when it comes to uh, startup ecosystem. Uh, when we are looking at Finland, they are looking at information technology partnership with India and communication partnership with India. When you look at uh, US-India partnership, we are already having various mechanisms through science and technology forums where we are looking at partnership on artificial intelligence and uh, knowledge sharing, uh, a constant uh, annual, biannual, bilateral meets, we are working with them. Uh, through funding and finance, we are working with Japan, South Korea, and uh, a couple of other countries. So 
uh, and, and whoever, wherever I have met people, whether it's Central Europe, it's Eastern Europe, Western Europe, everybody is looking at India uh, for the skill that Indians possess when it comes to uh, um, many management issues, uh, whether it's Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, any of the countries which are very, very good with uh, technology themselves, but they are constantly having that faith in Indian professional that they know that Indian professionals are highly skilled individuals who can uh, manage uh, so many other uh, uh, questions which are which are open for everyone, whether it's developmental issue, it's management of democracy, it's uh, education, technology. And thus, uh, the partnerships have to be uh, global in nature, in the sense that when you're engaging with a global network, the rule-based system becomes very, very pertinent and important. And also, uh, when it is uh, requirement and needs, now, obviously, the need of several other countries which are financially uh, better off will be very different at a very different level as compared to India, where data is, I think, cheapest in the world, uh, most inexpensive data usage, simply because we are such large number user base in, in this country. And um, when it comes to strategy, because uh, as a politician and as someone who... Uh, is part of uh, external affairs, the strategic partnerships also become very, very relevant. And when it comes to strategy and partnership, I think the kind of partnerships India is looking at, the UK-India relationship is uh, also looking forward that strategically uh, we need to uh, meet each other's need. So whether it is data management, it is blockchains, it is, uh, uh, I must say, infrastructure, which is the hardware part of it, not just the uh, management part of it. Uh, we all need to relook because uh, seeding and interseeding is something which is very much a reality in today's day and age. So how servers are going to be managed, how cybersecurity is going to be handled, whether it's the UN agencies or others, we need to take a relook at the hardware systems. I sometimes feel that uh, in, a, in, a, in a hurry to have cheaper iPhones, we all forgot the hardware management issue. And uh, in this hardware management issue, or it's the Android base, most of you are uh, from technology and uh, you will understand these issues better than I do. Uh, but I do rely on uh, uh, many solid reasoned arguments that we need to somewhere find a solution to these problems because cyber security, digital literacy, digi digital education are some aspects which we all need to be very conscious of. And also management of data is relevant while technology is very, very important to find and figure out the solutions like tech, the future of the world, the future of India is dependent on technology. Uh, that is not to take away the point that while it is dependent on technology, technology can't be compromising sovereignty of any nation. And when sovereignty issues of sovereignty occur, then we need to find technological and uh, non-technical solutions for rule-based engagement on those aspects. So far as our love for technology, as Government of India is concerned, is world-renowned, whether it's FinTech, it's uh, EduTech, it's um, uh, all other technologies, we, have, uh, we are providing solutions to the world and we are providing solutions to our own country. But uh, while doing that, what should be, what should be the uh, engagement base and how we are going to handle the uh, infrastructure, uh, back-end management, logistic chains, and uh, the cost, and uh, while handling the cost, the cybersecurity issues, uh, is also something we all need to find solutions to. And I have complete faith in the... Uh, creative minds of um, uh, from India and uh, outside uh, who will find good solutions and who will find sustainable solution 
and for resilience, because the last aspect is resilience. So I think when it comes to resilience, uh, resilience also means that we all need to uh, self-analyze. The analytics which all of you do is relevant to do the self-analysis and understand the gaps also which exist in the system. Only when we understand the gaps will we be more resilient. Because to meet the present challenges along with the future challenges, the military use of data, the, the militarization of uh, cyberspace uh, are some issues which we all need to understand and deal with because they directly impact the safety and security and sovereignty of a nation. And without sovereignty and uh, I must say the pious nature of democracy is such that people when expressing themselves need to have that surety and security that this ecosystem which is giving me safety net of expressing myself will be there while I am communicating my thoughts. And the moment that particular aspect is taken away, then the very existence of a democratic nation becomes compromised. And we can't, while, while handling technology, allow any such undemocratic methods of handling any other country's sovereign issues. And thus, it becomes more and more relevant to understand technology, uh, wherewithal of technology, uh, while it is good to engage with technology to find solutions, it is all the more important to find safe and secure means to deal with those solutions and keep working at it for futuristic plans and technology, innovation, um, analytics, all are very, very important aspects of any sovereign nation. And all the technologists, I'm sure, will find solutions to those kinds of problems and also keep working at the hardware. I'm again emphasizing that it's very, very important to pay attention to the hardware aspect. With these words, Jai Hind, thank you very much. I'm open to answer a few questions. Ma'am, thank you so much for spending the time with us. We really appreciate it. And I think your remarks cover a range of issues that have been discussed yesterday, today, and hopefully tomorrow. But I wanted to go a bit broader on the first question. You talked about the importance of India and that the eyes of the world are in India. We certainly hope the eyes of the world are in the Global Tech Summit. Um, we have tech startups from different parts of the world who've tuned into the GTS. Is while the eyes of the world are in India, the world is also changing quite fast. In the last three to five years, we've seen multilateralism being transformed in many different ways. India seems to have put its bet in smaller groupings rather than on the large multilateral sort of tag or the bill that we had in the post, say, Second World War period. What is it, ma'am, according to you, that sort of shapes India's approach to multilateralism, minilateralism, or the way we're seeing this kind of more fragmented universe today? See, so far as India is concerned, uh, in, uh, the world is not fragmented. The world is uh, one big family. Uh, we believe in Vasudev Kutumbakam. We are all one big family. Uh, but one big family may always have certain elements which are uh, non-familial non -familial in nature. So engagement on those bases could be temporary. But when it comes to engagement with the world at large, we are open to engagement with the world at large because it is for the good of everyone that uh, world be one and with one voice, let's all uh, think in terms of saving the planet. Let's all think in terms of saving the mankind. Let's all think in terms of peaceful coexistence. And when it comes to peaceful coexistence, whether it is COVID or uh, cyber attacks or cyber security or space technology becomes very, very relevant from these perspectives. And we must engage in a rule-based manner. And we always insist that there is a rule-based engagement for the world at large because no one person or no one country can threaten the other. And uh, when it is existential question, we are always on the side of the right. Ma'am, on the rule-based order, um, we seem to be at a critical juncture in India 
where not only tech companies, but societies at large within India and outside are waiting for the rules of the highway when it comes to India's digital architecture, which seems to be in the making. You were uh, the chairperson for the JPC on the privacy bill. I was just wondering, ma'am, how do you see that sort of unfolding? A, are we going to see a bill sometime soon be tabled in parliament? And will that give some sort of a policy architecture um, for many of those engineers that you talked about, the innovators that you talked about? And the reason I ask this is there is a fair bit of hesitation also among innovators, say, in terms of cryptocurrency or a range of other issues. So where India has huge promise, we India is a unique country, it built UPI, it's built the highways of the digital universe. Um, but we seem to be also at a place where people are still waiting for that policy architecture to be formalized. Where do you think we are, ma'am? So we are obviously at a juncture where technology needs to balance the long-term goals of a sovereign nation. And long-term goals of a sovereign nation, a democratic nation, cannot be compromised. And thus, there is no hurry of any sort. When it comes to hard work, whether it's fintech or our digital uh, uh, digi locker to all kinds of innovation that India is engaged in, no one is uh, stopping any innovator. On the contrary, we are promoting innovators to work uh, 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 work across uh, the world, uh, across the globe, uh, to reach uh, and make their mark. But when it comes to using, say, I'll just speak about cryptocurrency because you mentioned it. So when it comes to cryptocurrency, if cryptocurrency is going to be used to launch cyber attacks on India, to launch other attacks on India, to do other kind of illegal uh, and unethical work like drug trafficking. I need to stop all that. And thus, a fintech world will take care of it. I'm very sure about it. And cryptocurrency, uh, in government of India has already given its mind, is, is for that reason. Because any, any stashing away of uh, black money and utilizing it against our own country and dealing in any illegal, unethical methodology which, is, uh, which it is being used, uh, every country has a right uh, to ban and deal with those things because uh, they are attack on the sovereign nation. So when it comes to sovereignty, the question of... Uh, uh, any technology which is going to work uh, against the existence of our country, we will take all the steps to deal with that. Uh, that is as much part of innovation. Uh, but uh, when it comes to innovation to find solution to the problems, uh, we promote all that. You find a solution to air pollution, we'll, we'll support. You find a solution to traffic problem, we'll support. You find a solution to COVID vaccination, we'll support. So you find a solution to educate uh, children far off who, have, uh, who don't have access to uh, good teachers or uh, IIT professors, uh, we'll support. So uh, technology, garb of technology can't be uh, uh, avail onto illegal and unethical practices. And when it comes to our uh, law making, I would say we put in a lot of work into making of law. But uh, since uh, I am no longer uh, part of the uh, grouping, uh, or, or part of, or, or I'm no longer the chair of uh, data protection um, uh, committee, uh, I think the ones who are handling it presently will be in a better position to answer. But I think we are meeting tomorrow. I've been called for a dinner. <laughs> so uh, it's some kind of acknowledgement, I can say. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. We've got a lot of questions online, and I'm sure the audience here will have. But I wanted to ask you a slightly more personal question before we open it up to the audience. You joined the Ministry of External Affairs as the Minister of State in July. How are you enjoying it? Um, enjoying my work. Enjoying uh, the role. Uh, absolutely. Because uh, along with uh, uh, external affairs, my part duty is the MOS culture also. So uh, I think uh, if you get to do what you love to do, uh, it is exciting. And the work, I mean, I've spent my uh, life dealing with the uh, black and white letters of the law. Uh, and I can today say... Uh, uh, though I kind of made my mark there, but uh, I enjoy this work more because you are able to talk about culture, you're able to talk about archaeology, you're able to learn 
um, all the dance and performances which country has to offer, different languages. Uh, uh, you, and I must announce to all of you that today uh, Durga Puja has been entered into the UNESCO list of intangible heritage of India. So I uh, wish to acknowledge it publicly, wish to thank all the countries who supported us and uh, the entire team of culture ministry and uh, all the officers from MEA who were on the task working for it uh, round the clock. Thanks, every everyone, and congratulations, India. Congratulations. So these are achievements which you kind of, uh, which your normal practice wouldn't have brought. You may have made more money, but <laughs> this kind of satisfaction that you are able to put India where India belongs, and to uh, kind of uh, tell the world what we are all about, uh, is is a great feeling. is is uh, very satisfying. Ma'am, when you're traveling in the world, what we've seen in the Ministry of External Affairs is a sort of transformation in the last decade. There's a new emerging science technology division within the ministry. So clearly tech cooperation is the at center, I would think, of the ministry's approaches. One of the big areas of discussion we've had at the GTS is how do you get India's highways on technology to become the global standard, either regionally or internationally, UPI is a very good example. If I could just ask you, ma'am, do you think we need to take a push in terms of making the rules rather than, you talked about the global local disconnect. How do we push ahead? How do we get India's tech across the world? See, I, I personally feel sometimes you don't really need to push. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is an automatic pull factor and that pull factor comes, you see, we were, sorry, I hope my patriotic brothers and sisters are not going to mind what I'm going to say because that is not my opinion. That is my perception of how we were looked at before 2014. Before 2014, I wouldn't say people looked at us as a snake charmer's place, but a little better than that. Uh, but we were still not considered to be leaders or we could ever deliver on anything. We were not considered to be people who could stand by our commitments. But today people are seeing that we are capable of transforming India and we are capable of transforming the world. An unfortunate factor uh, which COVID brought to the globe, uh, so many deaths happened and so much of chaos, economy suffered. I, I mean... The, the world was moving in one particular direction. All that got disrupted. But that disruption also awakened many souls. And that disruption showed the world what India has to offer. In terms of uh, spiritual well-being, uh, to our value system, uh, from namaste to yoga to um, uh, being vegetarian, everything found its own niche place. And Aside that country which people had very less expectation, showed that we could manage COVID, we could produce the vaccines, and we could vaccinate people. And which also showed that in terms of technology, that we have 130 crore people, and everybody is Aadhaar linked. So uh, this kind of uh, system, uh, we can manage. Uh, so science, use of science and technology is today accepted. Today, when uh, I, I remember I was in a country, I won't name it, but I was in a country uh, much before I became uh, a minister. And those people in the, uh, in, uh, and everyone uh, uh, who was very well placed, some professors to uh, uh, some lawyers to some judges, they asked me a question and, and university uh, interaction where they said, Oh, uh, how do you find? How do you see that your things happen the right way? Then I give an example of uh, uh, Jandhan Khatas, uh, that how we open these accounts and how uh, all the subsidies directly going to people and direct benefit transfers, etc. And when they said, oh, and when I talked about number, they were all in shock. Today we've stopped shocking the world. So today, if we say this is what we have achieved, people expect that, oh, this is possible. This is India, it's possible. So this kind, I think, a political leadership, political will, 
uh, matters when it comes to delivery systems. Today, the delivery mechanisms have proved to the world that we have the capacity, we have the knowledge, and we have the good intentions, and we are harmless people. We are not causing disruption and uh, dis or, or harm to the world. We are, we are, in that sense, harmless people. So sharing technology with us, uh, helping us build uh, our country, uh, helping us uh, uh, find solutions to the problems is actually helping the global leadership because then our solutions are available to everybody else. I think that's a, that's a very, very positive and good thing which the country uh, can proclaim today. I mean, recent past, I should say. Thank you, ma'am. We've got a lot of online questions, but I'm going to abuse the fact that we're back in a room. It's a hybrid format. So I'm going to open the questions to the room and apologize to many of those across the world logging in. Yes. If you could just ask you to keep your question a little short, that would be great. Thank you. Sash, take off your mask, please, for a minute. Madam Minister, Namaste. Namaste. My name is Binay Panda. I am a professor in JNU. Now, I think this question is pertinent because you hold portfolios of best two ministries, external affairs and culture. You talked about technology and sovereignty. You know, one of the things about our policy from lookist to actist, one of the areas that I think there is a lot of growth potential, and I'm just picking up on what you mentioned about identifying gaps, is on the ASEAN countries. If you really look at the ASEAN, we have, I don't think there is any other country who have more cultural impact than India. From Indonesia to, except probably Vietnam, all other comes from Indic. You know, the influence up from India is very large. Even Vietnam. Even Vietnam, but I guess that's probably, I'm just telling because that's probably only so-called the communist influencing countries. Sorry, if I could ask you to just cover the question, yeah. sir. Yeah. The question is, what are we doing to improve our standing with ASEAN vis-a-vis -vis using technology? Because what I see is we are losing... So if you don't mind, we're just yeah. on the clock, so we've Thank got you. the question. Thank you. Ma'am, India and ASEAN. So India and ASEAN, we are, we are having all kinds of engagements. And when it comes to Indian footprints in this region are very, very uh, deep and long-lasting. And uh, I, I must tell you, because a lot of people are listening, Son Temple in, uh, Son Temple, as they say, uh, in uh, Vietnam has been re re refurbished, I should say, uh, uh, by Archaeological Survey of India. Same thing with Cambodia, Laos. We have several projects run in, running in these uh, particular region. We have very, very deep ties. So whether it's technology or it's... Uh, uh, Buddhist circuit or its Ramayan circuit, we are deeply, deeply connected. And part of my job is to engage with all of them. Uh, we are having Vietnamese uh, foreign minister landing in India tomorrow. And uh, we are going to have engagement and uh, various meets with them. And at multilateral fora, at bilateral foras, we are always on the same side. Whether it's uh, whichever be the political regime, we are mostly on the same side. And so uh, when you say technological uh, 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 cooperation, uh, we are working very closely with them and we are building uh, capacity. We are working on education system. We have very various, various, many engagements, science and technology to cultural engagements. Lady over here, get a mic please. Fan of yours. My name is Asha Jadeja. I'm from Silicon Valley. I'm a venture capitalist. Been there for 30 years now. Been investing mostly in the valley, but a little bit here. My, uh, you know, request to you is to please keep an open mind about the cryptocurrencies. I just want you to know that about probably 70% of Bitcoin is owned by Indian programmers. Uh, Indian programmers, developers, and even gamers are a huge part of the crypto web. We are also taking a lead on creating NFTs now, and a lot of young artists are making. Uh, you know, livelihood almost on using NFTs in, on the crypto web. 
So I just want you to, if you go for a meeting tomorrow, I just want you to keep an open mind that there, there's, a, there's a huge Indian presence on the crypto web. And it can be leveraged by, uh, by f people like yourself who are in, the, you know, in an important ministry here. And I'm happy to facilitate some of that. Uh, so I can put it differently. One is crypto is directly not under my charge. And I trust the people who take these decisions. Uh, I'm sure uh, they have applied themselves. And probably they know that uh, this is owned by a set of people who are trying to avoid tax. And uh, uh, they are trying to take money out of the country without uh, giving benefit to the country where you produce this wealth. So I'm sure they have looked into all this. And they will still look into it. Uh, that's my assurance. But this is not directly what I handle. This is finance ministry along with uh, uh, Ministry of uh, Information Technology. Uh, so they will be, they would have looked deeply into it. They would still look deeply into it. If I'm asked of my opinion, definitely I will give my opinion. And right now, uh, I really don't have much to say except the line which the government of India has already taken. Ma'am, could I just ask you on that? Text becoming ever more geopolitical and complicated. Um, there are various ministries in the country working on a variety of problems, but something that we've often advocated, at least in the think tank space or the research space, is an office of sort of technology coordination where Ministry of External Affairs can work alongside agencies, departments, the DOT, Metis, etc. Do you think those are kind of structural changes that might come down the line? Because it seems to be becoming more and more important from all the tech captains sort of sitting here. So, Rudra, I must say that it, this mechanism already exists. And uh, in this mechanism, uh, various people are consulted and various groupings of uh, uh, ministries also happen. I just said I am not part of it. So, at, at, a, at a certain level, I'm so sure that uh, people are being consulted and are consulting. Uh, and uh, so there will be, say, on crypto, there will be finance ministry working with uh, technology, uh, information and technology ministry and uh, uh, several other departments. And maybe somebody from MEA, maybe EM or someone else is part of that group. Maybe commerce and trade is part of it. So I am very sure that those grouping of ministries exist when you're finding solutions to uh, complicated subjects. And uh, they, there are nodal ministries to handle certain things. So uh, say within my ministry also, MEA for example, MEA worked very differently uh, as compared to say July this year. When um, I was given this charge, this charge was given specifically with the, uh, with the interest group uh, where you make a carve out. Say, MEA would be handling science, technology, finance, bilateral cooperation, multilateral cooperation, uh, geographical um, uh, cooperation, and mostly our ministry, like MEA, works with geographical entities like Latin America, um, Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Central Europe, like that. We, Africa, we work in geographical entities, but there was a special carve out done. There's one person who is given culture and external affairs. So while you may have a geographical base to handle uh, all the subjects of that region, in addition, you are charged with uh, handling culture across, across continents to, so that uh, whether it's international agencies where you're cooperating, bilateral issues, but just the culture carve out is given now. So uh, even Ministry of External Affairs is now co-opting to work with culture ministry to handle uh, various aspects, whether it's ASI work in those countries, it's museum building in those countries, it's getting certain documents uh, which are relevant for us or for them, exchanging those ideas. So uh, this interdepartmental mix is uh, happening to improve uh, uh, governance. I, and I'm so sure even in case of uh, uh, technological questions in terms of uh, cryptocurrency or um, education and so on and so forth, there, there are several interministerial groups working on it. Ma'am, we've got a lot of questions online. I'm just stick to one. I'm very mindful of your time. You've been very generous. 
Um, the questions on, in the last two years, we've seen a drift towards quote-unquote decoupling. The external affairs minister, in his opening remarks, made very clear is perhaps that decoupling is not the right way to think about the future. De-risking or hedging for countries is the way to think about the future. You talked about building India's resilience. How do we build resilience whilst de-risking or hedging the changing geopolitical landscape that we live in today? So there are partnerships and relationships uh, which have uh, stood the test of time. And uh, those relationships which have stood the test of time in spite of, in spite of geographical changes which we may be witnessing right now. Uh, historically, there will be people and technically there will be countries uh, which we have partnered with over a long period of time. And as I said, shared value system. Now when it comes to shared value system, it doesn't take uh, a lot of uh, my time to explain to uh, some of the countries that this is what we stand for and this is how we are going to engage. We are, we are actually, uh, you know, uh, people who are there for general good of the society. We are not the kinds to uh, disrupt anything and based on that principle, we will have engagements. and. I'm again going back a little, an oft-reported oft -reported and oft-repeated remark that when we produced vaccines, uh, I think uh, for some people it was like hitting a gold mine. For many countries, they, they de when they made vaccines, it was like hitting a gold mine. For us, it was like, it's like Amrit, which is a slightly different connotation. Uh, Amrit is uh, far more, far more uh, Im uh, precious than the gold mine uh, because uh, it is towards eternity. It is a, it is a uh, compote which takes you to eternity. For us, vaccine was Amrit, which is meant to be given to everyone, not just our people. Of course, primary duty is to save our people. But if my own people, there is a certain time within which it needs to be consumed. So this manna from uh, human innovation has to be provided to anyone who is in need. And thus, we gave it to 193 countries. Uh, I think one needs to understand it from that perspective, that this is what India stands for. We stand for global good and anyone who wants to engage with us for goodness, for humanitarian aspect, for well-being of people, people in need, uh, people who respect uh, uh, human value system, we are there. And thus the geopolitical strategic things uh, may have some impact on our engagements but definitely all those engagements we are not doing it to harm anyone. These are more in the nature of self-preservation, uh, protection, and also engaging with the world to, to help the mankind and protect the planet also. Ma'am, you've been very generous with your time. Thank you so very much. Thank you. And we hope much. we can host you next year in Bengaluru, Thank the home you of the GTS. Much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you very much.